I'm David Knowles, and this is a special episode of Ukraine, the latest. Bravery takes you through the most unimaginable hardships to finally reward you with victory. If we give President Zelensky the tools, the Ukrainians will finish the job. Slava Ukraini! Nobody's gonna break us. We're strong. We're Ukrainians. The Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, is the spiritual leader of the Anglican Church. Recently, he visited Kyiv, spending several days in Ukraine meeting chaplains, religious leaders and civilians impacted by the war. I spoke to him about his visit, the concept of forgiveness in the midst of a brutal war, and finding God amid the horrors and cruelty of missile strikes, occupation and death. Here's our conversation. Well, Archbishop, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining us today. Could you start just by telling us where you went in Ukraine? What did you see and why did you go? I went for pastoral reasons, really, which is I'd been in December 22. A lot had changed since then. They had the major offensive process last summer with the disappointment of that. And a whole year had passed. There was heavier bombing. And so I went for pastoral reasons. I also went for ecumenical reasons, relations between the churches, to see how things are going between the Orthodox Church of Ukraine and the Ukrainian Orthodox Church, the latter being before the all-out war, Moscow facing, and the former being focused on uh, arising out of the Tomos issue, the decree issued by the ecumenical patriarch in Constantinople in uh, 2018. So that was why I went. Where did I go? Very simply, Kiev for three full days and then a couple of days in Odessa. Drove down from Kiev to Odessa and then drove out via Moldova and Kisinau. Can I take you to something you said on the train to Kiev that I read in the reporting from the Church Times? You wrote, coming again to Kiev, I'm reminded of the vast extents of suffering. Uh, as I look out on the snowy landscape and think of people in trenches on both sides, uh, there's so much suffering. You must have heard so many stories which really moved you. Am- amid all of these stories, where do you find the divine? Where do you find God in this war? It was a question I asked myself and I asked others, particularly newly formed groups like a battalion of army chaplains from the Protestant churches, the Reformed churches, but also the uh, Metropolitan of the Orthodox Church of Ukraine. I think the answer to that for me has always been in zones of conflict that I find God in the middle of it, that to go back, to very well-known books like The Crucified God, that sense that we tend to veer theologically between a docetism, that sense that Jesus is only pretending to be human, and the sense that Jesus is only a sort of second-rate God, as it were, that he's not fully God and fully human. When we take his humanity seriously, we remember that God was crucified with all the filth and horror of that. And when we take the incarnation seriously, we remember that God lived as a baby, had his nappy changed, all these sorts of things. That sense of the entire humanity of God and the entire divinity of Jesus of Nazareth. So you find God in the mess with us and you see the signs of God's presence for me in for instance things like a civilian group in a near Odessa who go into villages under bombardment and extract civilians and bring them to a place of safety treat them for trauma help them find a new way forward when I said why they said because Jesus came to be with us When you're thinking about that suffering then, does that at any point test your own faith? Funny enough, I was talking about that as we were driving with one of my colleagues on the trip. No, it doesn't. What I realised was, because I think I might in the past have said, yes, but not really meant it. 
accurately by because I was misinterpreting the phrase test my own faith. It doesn't ever make me doubt that God exists. I suppose the faith testing is in the love and presence of God and as to whether he's on our side, as it were. I don't mean against the Russians. I mean, in the way Job says in the book of Job, round about chapter 19, the sort of theme that comes through there is, look, I know you exist. I just w wish you weren't against me. And that is the test of faith. Is God a God who loves those who God has created, or is God either indifferent or hostile? Can I ask about your experience praying in front of a display made of items salvaged from churches destroyed in the wars? What kind of items were you seeing there, and what was your reaction? That must have been an incredibly difficult moment to see the destruction visited upon a place where you work. Yes, a really good question. I think it was very moving. Do you know, I mean, this is going to sound very naff, but my first response, looking at bits of lead roof with holes punched in them, was to be rather clearly reminded of how violent conflict is. That when you're hit by a bit of shell, it doesn't just cut you, it blows bits off you in the way it had blown bits off that building. Shell fire, mortar fire, missiles, even small arms do enormous damage. And thinking if it does that to a bit of lead roof, what does it do to a human being? The second response was the sheer indiscriminate nature of the cruelty. They weren't aiming necessarily particularly for a church. It's just there was a church there, a shell landed, 150 millimeter shell, and everything around it gets shredded. Human beings, pets, possessions, churches. And the cruelty and absurdity of that is, is very forceful. I was... One of my favourite po poets has always been Wilfred Owen oh, for many years, and I was just forcefully reminded of when he says, my subject is war and the pity of war. And just going back to something you said earlier, that sounds like a very profound point, that God is not a God of the armies and of the sort of the truly awesome power of a Iskander missile or a tank shell, but rather is found in the baby sheltering. Is that what you mean when you say, where is God? What side is God on? Well, not the side with all the firepower in the world, but the side of the family sheltering from that. I think that God is certainly in the shelter. And there was, I can't remember, I think it was the Tuesday, early in the morning, there was quite a heavy air raid in which quite a lot of people were killed in Kiev. And I potted gently down the stairs to the shelter when the air raid sirens went off. And I decided that really I did need to be, even saying it aloud sounds bonkers, but I felt I needed to be presentable. So I got dressed and washed and, and so on. So cheerfully, the team with me hadn't noticed my absence. That was deeply reassuring. So we had quite a joke about that. They were saying, oh, we were just noticed a couple of minutes ago. We were wondering where you were. And um, then... Everyone down there in the shelter or from all kinds of places, including really senior sort of VIP guests in Kiev who were seeing the most senior people in Kiev the next, uh, that day, we're all, we were all in exactly the same place. And if something had hit that shelter, it made no difference who you were or what you were. You could be a baby brought down there to shelter by your parents, and there were two or three of them. You could be an archbishop. You could be head of the external affairs service for the European Union, the equivalent of their foreign minister. You could be a soldier. You could be a whatever. It made no difference. And so 
the vulnerability of human beings, the fact that a life can end whether you're a baby or incredibly well-protected professional because something that no protection can stand against has come in. And the fact that that's what God was. God was human. He had nails put through his hands. He was flogged. He had a spear in the side after he died. That sense of common humanity in an aero shelter is quite a sobering thought, or it was for me. Can I ask about forgiveness and mercy? How do we think of those ideas in a Christian context when it comes to, I'm thinking specific, I mean, I was in Butcher a couple of years ago, and you do see the scenes where the mass graves were. Yeah, I've seen that. I've been in Butcher and I've seen them elsewhere. Is there a way we can find forgiveness for, for the people who did that? Yes, because I've seen it and experienced it. But the absolutely critical thing is we don't put pressure on people. It's the cruelest thing pastorally when your city's under bombardment to start saying, well, you've got to forgive because you're a Christian or because you say the Lord's Prayer or whatever. So where is forgiveness, how it's found? I think forgiveness begins and it takes generations sometimes. I think forgiveness begins with us before God in integrity, not saying what we think God wants us to hear in our prayer, but saying where we really are. You go to Psalm 136, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept when they asked us to sing the songs of Zion. And the psalmist explodes and says, how can I sing the songs of Zion in a strange land? And then he goes on to reflect on the fall of Jerusalem that has led them to being in exile in Babylon and how their neighbours, so similar to today, were saying, down with it. And he ends up with that extraordinary verse, may we do to them as they've done to us. May we take their children and smash their heads against a stone. That's real hatred. And you see that in Ukraine. Understandably, I'm not condemning in any way or judging. But to go from there to saying, I forgive you and meaning it, is an enormous journey spiritually, psychologically, emotionally, physically. And where do you find forgiveness? You find it by saying to God, forgive? You've got to be kidding. How can I forgive this? How can I forgive that? I was listening to a woman who'd been evacuated from a village near Odessa on the banks of the river, and she said, my daughter was killed by shell. You don't say, well, you've, how are you going to forgive? You weep with them and you allow the Holy Spirit to bring them to a place where they're free to say to God, I don't want to forgive. I want to smash their baby's heads against a stone. And then you say at some perhaps years later, I don't know, I'd quite like to forgive. And then you say, God, enable me to forgive. And then you say, I sort of forgive. And then you say, I forgive. And then you go back to, I sort of forgive, because it's always two steps forward, one step back. So forgiveness is a long process and requires facing your enemy, but most of all, facing God and hearing from him. I forgive you. I laid my life down for you if that makes any sense at all. What would you say to people listening who really struggle, especially now, two years into the full-scale invasion for Ukrainians, of course, 10 years since the war, who struggle with a lack of hope? I've certainly detected it in lots of my interviews that th th there's no sense that this war is ending anytime soon. And you sense it from listeners around the world who want to help, want to show solidarity, but equally don't necessarily see the light at the end of the tunnel. What do you say to people? Who's, who, who say that? First of all, I'd point to the fact that on this visit, it was much more somber than on the 
previous one. But it was no less determined. I think I read something I wrote, which I was a bit, didn't think quite worked, but I did describe the mood as doer but determined. And so the first thing I'd say, these people have lost huge numbers of people dead and wounded, 20% of their territory, but they're still determined. And someone, one the, a very leading figure at, in Ukraine said, unconsciously, virtually quoting Winston Churchill in 1940, even if everyone, they said, abandons us, we will go on fighting if necessary alone. And so that's the first thing. You've got an incredibly determined bunch of people, and that gives us hope. I'd say the second thing is it is essential that we support all those who, albeit with fighting, are longing for an end to fighting and to war in this area. Third thing is, for them, it's an existential struggle, but for Western values, it's an existential struggle. This is not a, quote, Chamberlain in 1938, in a country far, far away with people for whom we know nothing. This is the reality of people who want to live in democracy, in freedom, in their own country. They're like us. And so those things together, I think, our commitment to help, their commitment to resist the reality of an existential struggle for values and even for existence, existence of our values, even existence of the nation of Ukraine. These are absolutely essential things that they must hear the support of. And when they do, you can see that it brings hope. I realise we're coming to the end of our interview. So just one more question from me. Going back to By the Rivers of Babylon, we sat down and wept when we remembered Theo Zion. When you mentioned that, it's one of my favourite psalms, and it made me think of the Ukrainians who've come to the UK who speak a little bit like that about their home country, about how much they miss yes. Ukraine, how much they miss the food, especially I hear that a lot, the community spirit and, ev- and everything. How do you think we can better help and comfort and support those who are not just in Britain, but Ukrainians who are spread around the world? who've maybe started new lives, maybe will not go back, but still miss their own country. It's never comfortable being an exile, even if you want to stay. How do we comfort and speak to them? I think by listening, by saying they're valued, by not asking when when are you going back, which implies, do you really have still to be here? Above all, by grieving with them for what is happening to their country, their friends. I was very struck, almost no one I met over the six days failed to have someone at or near the front or someone who was wounded or dead as a relative or friend. Justin Wilby, is there anything we haven't said that you think is important for our listeners to hear and understand? I want to re-emphasise that for Ukraine, this is a physically existential struggle. I think for the West, this is the struggle for the existence of our values of the capacity to disagree and to learn how not to have wars. They're paying for it in blood. And we are helping with money. Let's pray and seek that it is never necessary because of the lack of our support now that we find ourselves in a similar position. Archbishop Justin Welby, thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much indeed. Ukraine The Latest is an original podcast from The Telegraph. To stay on top of all of our Ukraine news, analysis and dispatches from the ground, subscribe to The Telegraph. You can get your first three months for just one pound at www.telegraph.co.uk forward slash Ukraine the latest. Or sign up to Dispatches, our world affairs newsletter which brings stories from our award-winning foreign correspondents straight to your inbox. We also have a Ukraine live blog on our website where you can follow updates as they come in throughout the day, including insights from regular contributors to this podcast. You can listen to this conversation live at 1pm London time each weekday on Twitter Spaces. Follow The Telegraph on Twitter so you don't miss it.
To our listeners on YouTube, please note that due to issues beyond our control, there is sometimes a delay between broadcast and upload. So if you want to hear Ukraine the latest as soon as it is released, do refer to the podcast apps. If you appreciated this podcast, please consider following Ukraine the latest on your preferred podcast app. And if you have a moment, leave a review as it helps others find the show. You can also get in touch directly to ask questions or give comments by emailing ukrainepod at telegraph.co.uk. We do read every message. And you can contact us directly on Twitter. You can find our Twitter handles in the description for this episode. As ever, we are especially interested to hear where you are listening from around the world. Ukraine The Latest was produced by Giles Gear, and the executive producers are David Knowles and Louisa Wells.